Ladies and gentlemen, Yuan Ulen, France Liste de Jeux de, Le Jeu d'eau à Villa d'Est. Uh, we my name is Lizzie Shea. I'm trying to find something here. I'm the director of Yudis Culture Sphere. We are very, very thrilled to uh, be able and present this special program this evening on arts and science. Uh, this is a program which is dedicated to Yeo Klein, uh, who was a man of the arts, a scientist, and also a man of the arts. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Ingmar Ernberg from the Eva and George Clyde Foundation to say a couple of words before we proceed with our talk and our presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, representing both the Cultural Committee of Karolinska Institute and the George and Eva Klein uh, Foundation. We are very proud, honored and inspired to share this event with uh, Jewish culture in Sweden and Lizzy Shea. Uh, the George and Eva Klein Foundation is fundraising uh, to, um, uh, to get money to support young scientists with fellowships, young scientists who will work in the spirit, in the very special spirit of George and Eva Klein. George Klein uh, was a real world pioneer in cancer research, not least in the uh, found foundations of current uh, therapy with immunol using immunology or the defense system, uh, uh, where he and his wife Eva made seminal contributions. But in addition, he was a very strong proponent for bridging between the two cultures, uh, which makes this program uh, very appropriate to honor George. And we are so grateful to Jewish Culture in Sweden, Lisi, to uh, allow us to share this and to honor George. He did it in his um, writings, in his popular writings, and in his uh, public uh, appearances. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Very welcome. Thank we'll you. Lisi say now. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. And it is, um, yes, so we are very happy that uh, there is a foundation for uh, Eva and Jero Klein. Uh, Jero Klein was uh, an engaged a person in Jewish culture in Sweden, participated in many of our programs, uh, and uh, we're very happy and to honor him. Uh, this program is also in cooperation with the Handelsok Skolan and with uh, Konst Academy. So, and I want to thank Kulturrådet Stockholm Stad and Landsting for their support. We are having here um, two fantastic um, speakers. They don't need much introduction. Eric Kandel, Professor Eric Kandel, uh, Nobel Prize laureate. He was our um, guest in 2014 the, in the program Jewish Vienna, the formation of um, modernity. And um, there was a huge line even then, Eric, if you remember, bit, bit, bit chaos at Moderna Muset. Everybody wanted to listen. And we're so happy that we're, you're here with us. Uh, and um, you are also um, a Renaissance man, just like Yeo Klein has been, been reading books, uh, you, uh, you have all these uh, talks in, at Columbia University, among others with Jeff Koons. Um, Jeff Koons um, became one, the first artist in residence at Columbia, right, um, in 2017. So Jeff, for Jeff Koons, um, for us, it's the first time, it's a premiere for us um, to host him in Sweden, and we're extremely, he's been here many times, but not as our guest. So it's a great uh, privilege to to have um, Mr. Kuhns and uh, Mr. Kandel together. Uh, I want to say a few things that, um, you know, well, you know that uh, Jeff Kuhns is a very prominent artist. He's been exhibiting everywhere, including in Sweden. Um, and um, what I found out about you, Jeff, is um, that you're a board member on the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children which really touched me uh, to read, and that you have a family foundation that works um, to, uh, for, um, to prevent 
uh, exploitation of children. So this is something that I didn't know at least. Um, so I'm not going to say anymore. Um, I prepared a longer introduction, but time is running out. So I'm going to leave the stage. And what we do now is that um, the setup is that Eric and Dell is going to give um, an introduction, and then Jeff Koons is going to uh, give an introduction, and then they will have an exchange uh, between them, a shorter exchange. If we have time, we open for the audience, and if not, uh, we don't. But uh, <laughs> so, um, so anyway, um, so Eric Kandel, it is my great privilege to have you here. Please open the program for us, program on arts and science, two parallel. Yeah, continue. You gave me the title. So thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. Um, um, I've had a number of honors in my life. I've been privileged to have them. But I certainly will remember sharing a platform with Jeff Koons as being in that category. Uh, Jeff Koons is a remarkable artist. And I find it just thrilling to be involved with him, have the opportunity to spend some time with him. Um, so. Um, I'm introducing what is really a conversation between Jeff and myself by giving you a little talk on reductionism in art and brain science. <clears throat> the idea of two cultures. In his Reed Lecture of 1959, C.P. Snow, the physicist who later became a novelist, argued that the humanities and sciences are world apart. They have different goals, use different methodologies to achieve them, to advance human knowledge and society the two fields of inquiry need to bridge the chasm between them. One way of bridging the two cultures is brain science and art. Bonnet science represents a bridge between the natural sciences and the other on, the, on one hand and art on the other, the humanities. The humanistic questions are addressed by brain science. We who study the brain see brain science as a way to address in direct and compelling fashion humanistically important questions. Like how do we learn, how do we remember, how do we visualize things? And a reductionist approach employed in art, artists sometimes use common reductionist strategies, methodologies, very much like those that we use in brain science to achieve their goals. Mechanistically important question addressed by brain science, the nature of learning and memory. Learning is the process whereby we acquire new information about the world, and memory is the process whereby we retain that information over time. As a result, we are who we are because of what we've learned and what we remember. Moreover, the study of learning has broad cultural ramifications. Our understanding of the world and its art derives from what we have learned and what we remember. In addition, learning transmits culture across generation is a major vehicle for social progress. A reductionist approach to memory that I have used and a number of other people have used is a to try to simplify the, uh, the, uh, the problem we study. The human brain, your brain and mine, is quite complex. 86 billion neurons give a nerve cell or two. The aplysia brain, which is the brain I've used, is quite simple. It has only 20,000 neurons. And these are distributed in 10 ganglia. So each ganglion has only about 2,000 cells. The ganglion, I've studied the abdominal ganglion, has 2,000 neurons. And what is interesting about it are not only a few neurons, but many of the neurons are absolutely unique. You find the same L3, L6, L9, L7 in every ganglion of the animal species. These are uh, numbers we've assigned to them. They did not come born with these numbers. <laughs> you look at this ganglion, you'll see if you looked at 5, 10, 11 ganglia from different animals, that invariably the same cell is located in the same position. And if you record from it, it has the same properties. Um, in this very simple animal with a simple nervous system, we studied a very simple reflex, the simple withdrawal reflex, like the withdrawal of a hand from a hot object. If you apply a tactile stimulus to the siphon, which is an external organ, um, it activates a reflex circuit that causes a withdrawal of the gill like the withdrawal of a hand from a hot object. <clears throat> if you stimulate the tail, you activate modulatory neurons, and these act 
on the sensory neurons, including on the presynaptic terminal, to strengthen the connections between the sensory neurons and the, and the motor neurons. It's like when I bang on this table, I startle you, and you will respond to other stimuli in a slightly more dramatic fashion than you would have before. If you give one tail shock, you will remember that loud sound for a transient period of time. But if you give repeated tail shocks, you will produce an alteration in gene expression and a growth of new synaptic connections. So if any of you remember anything of what I'm saying today, and I urge on you to forget it, but if you by chance remember it for tomorrow, you realize your, your brain has been altered. And it's been altered by two things, alterations in gene expression and growth of new synaptic connections. When people hear this, they get very nervous. Alterations in gene expression and growth of new synaptic connections. <clears throat> Particularly some of the younger ladies in the audience get very nervous. They say, you know, I've just recently got it married. My husband and I are planning to have a baby and we're planning to start tonight. And I've heard this lecture here. My brain is going to be altered. Does that mean the infant that I'm going to give birth to is going to have a different brain because of this silly lecture that I heard today? Not to worry. <laughs> this occurs very peripherally in your brain. It will not affect the sperm of the egg. You have my permission to do whatever you want tonight. <laughs> so, but one of the things, one of the characteristic features of long-term memory, even for a talk like this, if you remember tomorrow, is that you will have a slight alteration in gene expression as a result of this. And certainly, after you listen to Jeff Koons, it's gonna make a powerful impression on you, and you will remember that forever. <laughs> so, if you produce sensitization, which is a form of learning in the animal that I've used, the plesia, you see a dramatic growth of new synaptic connections. This is control, and this is sensitized. And I mean this quite literally. If you remember anything tomorrow, what you hear today, and probably you'll hear, remember every word that he utters, probably forget most of the things I say, but if you remember what he says, it will be because your brain has been altered anatomically as a result of the experience of being here. Um, you have a representation of the body and the surface of your brain, an anatomical map, and when you use that map, it changes. So this is what you look like when nobody else is looking. <laughs> and if you use certain parts of your body, the representation of the brain will actually enlarge. So if you use the tips of these three fingers by pressing a paw repeatedly, there is a representation of each of those fingers in your brain, and you can see this right now, cortical representation of the fingers. But if you use the tips of these three fingers and not the others, you will see there's a growth of new synaptic connections. So this is amazing. Be careful to what you listen to because it's gonna alter your brain. There are reductionist approaches that are taken in art as they are in science. Artists like scientists sometimes use reductionist strategies, methodologies to achieve their goal. This idea has raised concerns among certain humanists that a reductionist analysis will diminish our fascination with art or will trivialize its deeper issues. But as I will try to illustrate, the scientific reductionism need not trivialize the richness of art. Artists have expanded our pre pre uh, appreciation and uh, of what there is to see in the world by focusing our attention on the most elementary aspects of their art. They have found that reductionism can bring out the spiritual qualities of art. And certainly, in Jeff's work is just an absolutely brilliant example of how can really bring out powerful sensations in ourselves as a result of looking at his art. And I simply want to give you an example of how uh, art forms can really affect you. This is an early Turner in which you see uh, ships at sea battling the storms of nature. And you see they're bending over in the mast and they're really struggling against this. And this is in 1803. He returned to the same theme in 1842, more abstract version. And if anything, this is even more powerful. It makes an even greater impression on you. And why is that so? Does anybody want to guess why this is so? Why does this make an even greater impression than this? We fill in the blanks ourselves. Brilliant. 
we have to use our own imagination to fill in the details. And that alone is a great stimulus to creativity. It's a great stimulus to the mind to be active. So this is one of the reasons that abstract art is so extremely effective, because it, the beholder becomes very, very important in responding to it, because he has to fill, he or she has to fill in all the details. The details are reduced. Ships merely suggested by the lines of the mass here, by conveying the overriding power of nature, Turner evokes in us an even greater emotional response. How is this greater emotional response produced? This is the concept of the beholder share. First developed by Alice Regal. Regal said he was the first art historian to bridge art to science, Viennese. He argued that art, particularly post-Renaissance art, invites the viewer's participation. Now, historically, all art did, but it became more powerful post-Renaissance. This beholder share, that's what it's called, the share that the beholder contributes to the work of art, was a key focus of art because it's essential for the completion of the picture. This challenge was taken up by Regal's two great disciples, Ernst Chris and Ernst Gombrich, both of whom I had the privilege to know. Ernst Chris said, great art is ambiguous. Ambiguity allows for alternative views on the past, on the part of the different beholders, revealing creativity in the beholder's share. So when you respond to work of art, you're not only looking at, at a piece of work that has been created by an artist who is you know, cr creative, but your response alone involves creativity in your part. And the more ambiguous the painting is, the more of your own creativity is recruited. So ambiguity allows for alternative views on a part of different beholders, revealing creativity in the beholder's share. The beholder re recapitulates in his own mind a creative process that parallels that of the artist. Illusion is a way of studying creativity in the beholder's response. The visual brain of the beholder is a creativity machine. The need for cognitive psychology visual perception was realized because of this, and influenced by Berkeley and the inverse optic problems and by Helmholtz's emphasis on bottom top, up and top down reconstruction of vision, Ernst Gombrich really developed this further. He said, look at this Casaniga square. Can all of you see this? Can you see this black square sitting on top of these uh, four white uh, circles? Raise your hands, I just want to make sure that you're all seeing it. Nonsense! <laughs> you're making it up. It simply is not there. What you have is an empty space, and if, if these four structures are positioned in the right way, it leaves an empty space for a square, and you fill it up with your own head, but there's actually nothing there. You have filled it in. So this, these unorganized circles do not create uh, illusionary contours because they're disorganized, but when they're organized in the right way, they force you to think of it as a square in the center. Jeff Koons has brought the concept of beholder share to its ultimate expression. With Jeff Koons, the beholders become part of the work of art. Uh, so if you look at a work of art, for example, one of Koons' things, you see the work of art. When you see the ball on the shoulder of the statue, what do you see? You see yourself. So this way the beholder becomes part of the work of art. The beholder share. When you look at the statue, you see the work of art. When you look at the crystal ball, you see yourself. You see the beholder. With Jeff Koons, the beholder becomes a part of the work of art. Here you see the work of art, and here you see yourself. Jeff Koons himself, this is him, becomes part of the work of art. And here, Denise and I are standing right here, and we became part of this work of art. So, this is a way of introducing Jeff and get the conversation between us going. Art is exciting, and one of the really wonderful things about it is many scientists are becoming interested in art, as artists, of course, have historically been interested in science, and the dialogue that is opened up as a result of this, of which hopefully this will be an example, really enriches the understanding of both disciplines. Thank you very much. <laughs> You know, Eric just uh, 
touches the, the, it's the top of the iceberg with everything that uh, <clears throat> Eric knows about the mind and art and how it functions. I remember thinking, uh, you know, who would be the most ideal person to, you know, to, to write about art? I had an exhibition at the Whitney and I thought, oh, Eric, Eric Kandel, it'd be so interesting, somebody, a psychiatrist that really understands, a neuroscientist, to really write about art. And of course, uh, Eric does write about art. And it's, it's so uh, interesting because when Eric was talking about the Turner and the beholder share, you could realize that just the strength of the opportunity that artists have to be able to give to the viewer, to really take them to a place that they can feel the type of intensity and energy. Uh, I often think about David Bowie and as a performer, and it's like, you know, he's like Apollo. He's up there when, when you'd be on the stage and performing. It's like, you know, that's as close as you can imagine of uh, like a godlike figure coming to earth, you know. And uh, so, uh, you know, we all have these moments to put people in contact with, uh, with the, the power that they have of their imagination. So uh, I did, when uh, Eric was speaking about reductivism, and uh, I just wanted to show that when I got out of art school and I moved to New York and I started to interact with my generation and had an opportunity to try to deal with the issues that were uh, important to my generation, I started to make works like this. This is inflatable uh, rabbit and inflatable flower. And I remember when I made this piece, it was so intense for me. Uh, the color, the pink color, the green of the inflatable flower. And what I really loved about it was it was affirming me, it was affirming the viewer. Now I created this in my studio. I really didn't have an, uh, an audience at the time. Maybe one or two friends would come by. But you, you walk by and the reflection would change. It was completely dependent on the viewer. And there's a slightly different time too because it's a reflective surface. And you know you have the right here, right now surface of, of the uh, rabbit, but you have something really close to the now and the reflective surface slightly different in time. So there's a sense of uh, metaphysics also taking place with the reflection. Uh, I felt that this work almost talked too much about myself, almost my own sexuality as far as like the intensity of the uh, color. But I was trying to make works. Uh, I was always a painter prior to this time, but I wanted to make works that I uh, thought were objective and that the viewer would have a similar situation. At least I could take them uh, to a certain point. And this is very minimalist again, just dealing with reflection. Uh, these were store-bought mirrors. I worked with uh, inflatable uh, objects that were ready-mades. The mirrors are ready-mades that I just bought. But here, everything is dependent on you. When you move around, again, the reflection changes, but very kind of high intensity, the colors that are there. It all triggers a, a type of uh, sense reaction. So after making these uh, inflatables, I wanted to deal with uh, kind of another uh, way of dealing with uh, ready-made. So I came up with the idea, the new. And the new was to show objects for being brand new, having their integrity of birth. As individuals, for us, when we think about integrity, we have to participate in life. But for uh, an object, uh, it's just born, and before being used, it has all the integrity. So I would encase them, and in a way, it's relating more to traditional uh, sculpture, even Renaissance uh, sculpture in a way, and I would let these objects just to display their uh, newness. Again, what I was looking for was the individual, the viewer, to look at it and to feel a, a gestalt of, about who's really better prepared to survive. You know, am I as a, uh, an uh, animate object or this uh, inanimate object? Sexuality is also uh, embedded in all these works. If you look at this vacuum cleaner, is it phallic? Is the, the uh, bag that holds the uh, 
uh, the dust uh, bag, is that uh, like a scrotum or is this actually feminine and it's a womb? And, uh, but this play of an object having both masculine and feminine qualities is very important, again, for this beholder share because you know half your audience is feminine looking at something and half is masculine. Uh, this is another vacuum cleaner piece uh, from the new series. And on the uh, side, it says wet dry. And I always loved that because it represented to me like Kierkegaard and Satra, like either or, uh, being and nothingness. And uh, uh, th these pieces for me were uh, uh, philosophical. They were about thinking of and contemplating uh, life and uh, you know what life can be. Um, uh, who's better uh, prepared to survive, the intensity of a, of a gestalt. After uh, making my vacuum cleaner pieces, I wanted to make something that would tie more to biology, as Eric was showing uh, with the brain science and uh, looking at some uh, neurons. I, I wanted to go more inside and not deal with you know, the kind of the surface of, of objects that people would think of consumerism. I wanted to go more uh, interior, uh, inward. So I created these equilibrium tanks. And for me, they're very, very metaphysical. It's, uh, it's the right here, right now. It's the past and it's uh, the future. Uh, it's like an embryo. It's, uh, it's pre-birth. This was pre the new. And when we talked about arts and sciences together, it's pretty hard for me to think about creating anything that I don't in some way think about a system. Uh, if I'm gonna be mixing color, I have to somehow start with a system of color, otherwise it's just like kind of throwing a dart. Am I gonna get there, am I gonna get close? But if you start with a system, you know if you go here, okay, then I can look at this system. If I add a little more yellow, is that gonna get me closer? But almost everything I do, I'm always coming back and relying on a system so that I can get to complete the vision that I originally had. But to make the tanks, I called up Dr. Richard P. Feynman, the Nobel Prize winner for quantum dynamics. And uh, I, I read in Time magazine that uh, he had loved art. So uh, I called him up and uh, he answered and I told him that I wanted to achieve permanent equilibrium. I want to do it in an aquarium. Can I do it? And he said, sure. And uh, I, I probably could do it. If he said I could, I'm sure I could. But I wouldn't have been able to do it within the aesthetics that I wanted to do it. I wanted it very pure. I wanted it very womb-like. I didn't want to have two immiscible liquids where I'd have like an interface between the two or having a lot of magnets or something around the piece that you couldn't see it. So I ended up not creating permanent equilibrium. These tanks will only last for maybe three, four months. And then eventually all the ions will interact and the ball will go to the bottom of the tank. So uh, right now in the equilibrium state in the center, the ball is too light to go to the bottom but too heavy to go to the top. And it's just a water density uh, gradient. For me, one of the most interesting aspects, and I hope Eric can even talk about this later, but what I experience as, as an artist is focusing on something. So I remember thinking, okay, I want to make something. I was putting things in plexiglass cases before vacuum cleaners, and I saw basketballs on white cases in uh, uh, sporting goods stores stacked up, and I thought, well, maybe I'll put a basketball in an aquarium, an ultimate state of being, equilibrium. This is, sounds interesting. And then I looked and I found Nike posters where I would see balls in equilibrium. That's like Moses parting the Red Sea. And then I would look and I would, I would find, oh, I'd find other objects that, like an aqualung, and I would think, oh, that's a tool for equilibrium. That you, okay, you see a tank, it's this ultimate state of being, I want that. I, I want to experience that metaphysics. And then you have the sirens, you have these Nike posters uh, with these people saying, you know, I've achieved equilibrium, go for it, you can achieve it too. And then you end up with the tools of equilibrium, like an aqualung, that you would go for it. But whenever I focus on my interests, it always takes me to a place where these inner narratives start to get created.
And they tend to uh, create that they have more interest than just myself, that other people too can also have interest in these uh, uh, narratives. And I find the more I focus, uh, the more connected to a universal vocabulary it is. After creating the, uh, the Equilibrium show, I, I started working in stainless steel. It was the first time working with stainless steel. And I remember walking down Fifth Avenue and I saw uh, this train. It's called the J.B. Uh, Turner train. Uh, Turner's here, right? Uh, a, a, a different Turner, but uh, it's J.B. Turner train and it's seven-fifths of bourbon. And so if you lift up the, uh, the smokestack of the engine, you can see a tax stamp seal there that uh, the liquor's uh, inside. Slide open the door of the baggage car, lift the log on the log car. But uh, each one's a, a bottle of bourbon. But I wanted the viewer to look at it and feel the visual intoxication from the reflectivity. I had a friend at the time that was becoming an alcoholic. And I saw the degradation set in their life and I would hear them babble. And I realized that a lot of the advertising in the, uh, uh, the advertising world, they're using very, very powerful abstract images on people uh, to debase them. And, and I wanted to show that art's a very powerful uh, uh, tool and we should develop these tools and, and use them, but there's a moral responsibility that, that comes along uh, with it. Uh, this is an example. So in uh, going through the different income levels at the time, this is 1986, the highest level that they would target somebody for alcohol consumption for an ad was $46,000 uh, and up. But here, uh, it's already just waves of liquor where the person, it says, stay in tonight. They're already lost in their own thought patterns. They don't even really have any communication with the outside world. And it's quite central to that was a frangelica ad. So uh, in 1986, I continued to work in stainless steel. Uh, this is the rabbit. Uh, most recently, it was in the, uh, the media a lot because of an auction that took place. But uh, when I made the rabbit, I really wanted to just show my history of working with ready-made objects back to the first image that we looked at that uh, inflatable vinyl. I made that back in uh, 77 and uh, 78. And in 86, I started to work with another uh, dealer, Ileana Sanaban, and I knew that she'd bring my art to a larger international audience. And so I uh, chose different ready-made objects to work with, and the rabbit uh, was one of them. Eric showed a gazing ball earlier on the shoulder of Hercules, and. Uh, uh, the reason I made that uh, sculpture and put the gazing ball there was uh, to, uh, to reference the generosity of a gazing ball. I grew up in Pennsylvania, and in Pennsylvania we have a large German population. So uh, King Ludwig II of Bavaria in Victorian times repopularized glass gazing balls. And so when I would be younger and I would look at them in people's yards, I would think how generous that is of the person to, uh, uh, to put that there. And Eric, one of your friends, uh, one of the Nobel uh, laureate uh, uh, winners, even received a Nobel Prize, a couple received the prize for a study that they did that uh, the mind is, is it the mind's always rewarding the body for telling it where it is in the universe at any given time? Uh, I guess it was about four or five years ago that this uh, uh, couple uh, won the Nobel Prize. And a gazing ball does that, but the head of the rabbit is a gazing ball for me. So when I made this piece, I thought, oh yeah, it's just like a gazing ball. And uh, I was really thinking back to part of my childhood. Everything that Eric was speaking before about the beholder's share and the viewer finishing the work. At this time, I'm making these objects, but the dialogue, I knew I was working with reflection for affirmation. That's I, what I would say. I would use the word affirmation, that it affirms you, the viewer, that it's about you. And uh, because I, I you know, wanted this, this dialogue, this intensity happens with uh, uh, the viewer. But the, the, the rabbit, people look at it, they can think of uh, the Playboy Bunny, they can look at it, they can think of Easter, 
Uh, they can think of an orator uh, with a, a microphone to the mouth, or they can think of a masturbator. Because of all that freedom for the, the viewer to finish the narrative is one of the reasons that it's been so iconic. So I've always worked with ready-mades up to this moment. And these ready-mades come from the uh, tradition of Marcel Duchamp, but now we have another link here back to Alois Regal because Marcel Duchamp would also uh, promote that the viewer uh, finishes an experience with a work of art. And I'm sure that Marcel Duchamp in Paris uh, after the turn of the century was picking up on the late 19th century, uh, early 20th century ideas coming out of Vienna of Alois Regal. And, uh, but, so I'm always working with ready-made objects and working in this Duchampian uh, tradition. And I made this piece called Kipp and Curl. And it was for an exhibition in Munster, Germany. Kasper Koenig uh, has this exhibition once every 10 years. So it's a very important show in Europe. I was a young artist in 87, I was invited. You make a site-specific work in Munster. I went there. And in the town square, they had a bronze life-size sculpture of, uh, of a, a man with a kip on his back coming to market. And it was in bronze, and it really celebrates the uh, self-dependency, uh, self-reliance that that community has. He has uh, pigeons, he has eggs, potatoes, hair, tobacco. I mean, it's totally independent. And uh, it was a piece that actually uh, originally uh, was made and then was destroyed during the war. Uh, a tank used it as target practice and destroyed it and the town remade it, made another version of it. And I uh, made a copy of that. I put it in stainless steel, but when the piece was at the foundry, before it was completed, they banged my casting up against the wall and totally deformed it. It was my Humpty Dumpty. So his leg was five inches too short, the rabbit, the hair, lost his ear. Uh, you know, everything collapsed. His face was a mess. And Casper uh, Koenig called me up and he said, you know, Jeff, I don't know uh, what to do. There's no time to recast another one. He said, we can bring in a steel guy and, uh, you know, we can try to fix it or you can drop out. And I realized that for me, this was a huge opportunity. I was just kind of breaking in the international art world. And I've only, the only thing I've ever wanted to do is to participate, to be involved in a dialogue about art and what it can be. So I decided to give the piece the radical plastic surgery. And they, uh, they brought in the this, this steel man. He was amazing. We worked on it for three months. He had heat up the piece till it was white hot and he had bend the leg and open it up and weld in a new piece of steel and we created an ear for the rabbit and fix the face and the chest, and we put this Humpty Dumpty back together again. And when I did that, I realized that the ready-made I cared about was the viewer. And up to this point, like, I had such a hard time choosing not to pull out of the exhibition because every perfection and imperfection of all these objects was so important to me that I would maintain like casting that train or that aqualung, every little detail, because it was the essence of the object. But I realized then that the, the ready-made I care about was the viewer, and I cared about their perfections and their imperfections. That was what uh, the ready-made I really wanted to work with. So that freed me, and that's when I started to be able to develop more of a, a narrative of what I was interested in, and to be able to create a work that would be able to help empower people, that they could embrace themselves, who they are, their perfections, their imperfections, and to be able to move forward. Art is something that can be tremendously uh, disempowering. It can make you feel like you have to come prepared to it. it you know, I remember being a kid and trying out for football, and I was cut the first day because I never played football. I didn't know any, I didn't even know what a first down was to a second down or whatever. And people can look at art as being the same way, and it's not. You never have to bring anything uh, to it other than who you are. And, uh, and who you are, it's perfect. You're perfect in your own being. And everything is always about this moment uh, uh, forward. So with the Banality series, I worked in different materials that would uh, deal with uh, 
the, the, the transcendence, like this is carved out of wood. All the wood carvers, it typically would be in northern Italy, carving a lot of saints for the churches, uh, carved this piece. This is called Ushering in Banality. And it's a little autobiographical. I thought I really didn't care what people you know, would say, but I felt that I was kind of on a positive mission in offering uh, banality. And to me, banality was just everything that you enjoy. Like I remember my, uh, my grandmother and my grandfather, the objects they would have, the, the objects I grew up with in my family. That, uh, or if you like the color blue for blue, everything's okay. Or if you like to see people balancing watermelons on their head, it's all okay, it's perfect, that's great. There's nothing better than balancing watermelons on your head. You know. This actually is called Woman in the Tub. <clears throat> my grandparents had an ashtray, a little ashtray of a woman lying down on a couch and her legs were up in the air. Came from after World War II, it was made in Japan. And you put a cigarette here, and supposedly the heat from the cigarette and the smoke were supposed to make the legs go back and forth. It didn't really do it, but with the help of your finger, they would go back and forth. And she had a little fan on her breast here, too. And as a kid, three, four years old, I was so captivated by that. And I know that that's really my woman in the tub, that it's really that, uh, that woman. And where her legs would fit down in here is really uh, uh, the tub. The reason I worked with uh, porcelain was porcelain's a very essential uh, material. It shrinks 19% in the oven, and uh, it's a very regal material. It came from the king's kitchen, the emperor's kitchen, but it's completely democratized today. And I wanted to communicate this sense of democratization and uh, empowerment and of self-acceptance. A lot of people don't accept themselves because they have a hard time accepting their own body. And this kind of references that uh, aspect of learning about one's body. Uh, I went on after the, uh, uh, the Banality series, and I made a piece called Puppy. I enjoy working also with organic elements. Uh, and again, it, you know, everybody, uh, every artist loves to believe if they really focus on their work, they can make something. It almost takes life's energy, but you know, you fail. You always fail. It never does that. But uh, this is made out of 60,000 live growing uh, plants. And uh, it's called Puppy. And I spent a lot of time in Europe and I wanted to make a piece that really dealt with the polarities that I found in the Baroque and the Rococo. You know, you have the symmetry with the asymmetrical, you have the organic uh, uh, eternal through life, through flowers and animals and uh, people, but you also have it through ideas and spirituality. And I think the piece is very much whether you want to serve or be served. You know? uh, this is a balloon dog. This is from a series in, that I started in, uh, in, in 1994. And uh, the balloon dog looks um, you know, very light and uh, a little frivolous. It could be something from a child's birthday party. But at the same time, uh, I think it has something very ritualistic about it. And uh, I, I look at it and I, I can envision, um, you know, a community having some ritual take place uh, uh, around it in our archaic times. Maybe uh, they look down at their kill and notice that gases were expanding the intestine and would make something like this. Also has kind of a mythic uh, uh, quality to it at scale. And it has the same masculine, feminine aspect. Uh, if you look in the, the front legs, they're kind of very feminine form, or the back legs, but the tail's kind of masculine. So these uh, different uh, references to both the masculine and the feminine are always taking place. But it's, a, it's affirming you. When you walk past, uh, everything is dependent on you. When you leave the room, the art leaves the room. Uh, this is Plato. Uh, I like to think of this as my Freudian sculpture. And uh, it's a, I have a son, Ludwig, and my son Ludwig's 26 now, but when he was five, I brought him some Play-Doh and he made a mound and I was a little distracted d doing something in another part of the room and he said, Dad. And I said, what? And I turned around and looked and he went, voila. And 
in front of him was this mound, and he was so proud. And I looked at the mound, and I thought, this is what I try to do every day of my life. I try to make something that removes judgment, that you, you can't uh, make any judgment about it. So I went back to my studio, and I made a mound of Play-Doh, and I, I turned it into this sculpture. The Freudian part, it seems to me a little bit like it could be like feces or something. It can go back to childhood or something. But it also has this uh, uh, 20th century. I think it really captivate, uh, captures the 20th century. It also has this abstract expressionism power of somebody like Bill de Kooning. Uh, th this is a, a piece from my Popeye series called Lobster. And I think that the lobster invites the audience in because you look at it and you, know, you see that the lobster's performing for you. And uh, at certain times, too, you also feel that it gets a reversed role and that you are kind of performing uh, uh, for the lobster. And both, again, masculine and feminine. In the States, we used to have a, a stripper uh, a female performer. They used to perform back in, I think, the 40s and the 50s, Gypsy Rose Lee, and she would have a fan, and she would always have a big feather fan and, and move around like this. The tail of the lobster always reminded me of that. But you can also look and think of the, uh, the body of the lobster as being a womb, or it could be a phallus. It goes uh, back and forth. But this, uh, the reversal about who's really performing here uh, I, I really believe if you're in the public eye long enough, this kind of happens. Everything kind of um, uh, eventually becomes obsolete, but the lobster also looks like it's being burned at the stake. If you see the graphics uh, and think of the graphics being flames, it has a, a very uh, Middle Ages uh, quality, and it's like we're watching uh, the lobster get uh, burned at the stake. Uh, this is a balloon Venus. Uh, it's a takeoff on the Venus of Willendorf. Uh, I like to think that uh, the balloon Venus uh, is a kind of an ultimate uh, symbol of fertility because if you look at the breasts of the balloon Venus, they're very full, very voluptuous. The stomach's very fertile, full. Uh, but uh, if you let the uh, breast become testicles and the stomach for a moment become a phallus, you see it can procreate on its own. A piece like this, first I'll make a balloon, I'll, I'll design it, and then I have to go back and forth. I work with a balloon artist to help get all the chambers just correct and what can physically be done with a vinyl balloon and, uh, and continue to tweak it. That usually takes at least a half a year to a year. Then I'll go and CAT scan it and we'll CAT scan different balloons, and then I'll be adjusting some of those CAT scans uh, so that uh, the symmetry of the balloon can uh, work. But every chamber is interconnected there. So if you go up through where the bladder is at the bottom of her stomach, that will go all the way up and connect to uh, the knot that's at the base of her neck. Everything's interconnected. Uh, this is a, a piece from the... Uh, uh, antiquity series, and it's a work that just makes a lot of inner connections going back through time. Um, um, there's a cloth there that you can see through, and uh, that's from Raphael Peel's uh, Venus Rising from the Sea of Deception. It's uh, usually opaque, but I made it transparent. And I was curious about that cloth, because when I look at Dali, Salvador Dali's last painting, A Swallow's uh, Tale, I actually think he was referencing uh, Raphael Peel's painting, Venus Rising from the Sea of Deception, and not Rene Thom's uh, type of, uh, I think it's uh, physics or some type of writing that supposedly uh, he was referencing. And then there are other uh, Venuses there and something that references uh, uh, Corbet. But this is just a large scale painting that, as Eric was talking about the beholder share, there are many ways that you can find yourself going in to a work like this and feel connected. Um, this is metallic Venus. <clears throat> it incorporates an organic plant. And a lot of these works are make reference to works in, uh, in the past because I'm also trying to play 
with time and that somebody also feels connected and finds us kind of a sense of greater meaning and that you feel this connectivity through human history. Our uh, cultural lives, we look at our genes and our DNA and we see this double helix, but our cultural lives externally uh, run very parallel to that, all the different interconnections uh, that take place. And as Eric was mentioning about through different experiences you have, that you can have uh, gene expression and the synapses changing who you are. I feel like I've never been the same since the first time I saw Manet's work. Uh, it, it changed my life. It changed who my, uh, my being is. Uh, this is a newer uh, piece. This is called uh, Ballerina. I take little uh, porcelain sculptures and I uh, place them into stainless steel and I take the gradations that were originally painted on the porcelains and put them on this mirrored reflective surface. And it's another way to depict time because you're, you're getting the, re, the reflection and uh, the kind of light bending type aspect moving around it but you're also getting these gradations through how it's painted. And that always makes your mind think of a sunrise, sunset. So it's another uh, form of time being depicted. This is a piece from the Gazing Ball series. Uh, this aspect of obsolescence. I'm back to uh, the rabbit. I mean, everything becomes obsolete. It's just how chameleon can something be for the viewer that they can find some interest in it that society today uh, still has a little interest, at least I have tried to show that, by using this bucket here that maybe at one time was filled with paint, that somebody would have filled it with cement to make it a post to hold up a mailbox. And what other ad adaptation does it have to take to continue to survive? Art is the same way. Uh, our bodies are the same way. Uh, this is a gazing ball uh, painting, and uh, this was my last series of paintings that, uh, that I made three years ago. I've just finished the series, and I really uh, love this uh, series of work where I repaint some masterpiece paintings that I really enjoy, that I feel are kind of part of my uh, DNA. They're part of the Western uh, art canon of history. And I take great care in reproducing them so that they represent the idea of that painting. They're not the exact size, uh, their surface is flat, but I take great care that every crack, every little aspect that's in the original that I'm able to have there. But these are, again, pieces that are for kind of time traveling because to experience transcendence, I believe, uh, Manet was able to become Manet because uh, he would give it up to Titian. And he's actually referencing uh, Titian's, uh, the music uh, lesson. And, uh, and he also uh, referencing Raphael's uh, uh, drawing of the Last Judgment of Paris based on Rimbaldi. And this type of interconnectivity by finding something greater than the self uh, lets us be able to experience transcendence. But you have the right here, right now through the reflection of the ball. And then the painting is also affirmed. So you kind of go in this rabbit's hole into uh, the painting to be in the time of Manet. And then from once you're in there, then you can again make these other references to the people that Manet is also giving it up to. Uh, so there, there are my slides that I have. And uh, it would be great. <laughs> Eric. Uh, <laughs> so we open it up for discussion. Good. Let's. Eric, I think you need a microphone. Excellent. Take the whole thing. Any questions, comments, elaborations? Yes. Uh, in terms of the gazing bowl painting, how does the ready-made that they discovered in the Fountain Hall Pit, so they sort of make this person, like the hands of the dead painting, <coughs> the recreation of the Hall Pit, through the painting? So, so the painting, you know, has a, a ready-made aspect that it, it pre-exists, and the, 
I'm really trying to deal with the humanism of it, to really, you know, try to be in contact like with Manet and deal with Manet as a person and, uh, you know, the connections that Manet uh, would make. So uh, I will go and re-photograph the original uh, artwork and I'll try to pay homage and respect to the time that the piece was made. So every crack that's there, I'm not going to freshen it up. I wanted to be able to capture the time that's taken place, uh, but still that it's just the idea. And then the gazing ball, I really wanted to come back to something pure. And for within my uh, dialogue with the world and uh, ready mates, this uh, pure globe, this pure form, even in uh, like a Platonism type of, of way of looking at something very, very simple and, and pure. I wanted to go to, you know, kind of the, um, uh, the essence of the ready-made. What are you working on now? What should we look forward to in the next several years? Yeah. Uh, I've started a series of work called the Porcelain Series that, uh, Porcelain Series, that I'm working with uh, 18th century uh, porcelain pieces. And I transform them into the stainless steel and uh, take all this surface uh, off them, similar to the ballerina that I showed. But I think that there, uh, something happens. I mean, they're not just like this, uh, the original porcelain. Something really uh, strong and uh, powerful uh, uh, takes place. I'm always making new paintings. I'm working with some different images of uh, Agostino Caracci that I'm using as a base uh, uh, for some of uh, uh, the new work. I always have uh, some public scale sculptures that are going on. I think my train is finally going to be made that I've been looking forward to. This is a sculpture where a 70 foot uh, steam engine hangs from a crane and performs uh, probably three times a day. Uh, it does everything a real train does, uh, but it does it in a much faster time. A real train, it takes eight hours to get enough power to pull out of a station. Uh, this will do that in 30 minutes, but then it'll end up going from, you know, the first kind of of the piston to going full speed, like 80 miles an hour of all this steam. It's just hanging in the air, the wheels spinning but all this steam coming out. It's very, very uh, authentic realism, even though it's not a real train. It's just complete authentic quality, though. <clears throat> then it's on a bell curve after a woo-woo, kind of uh, uh, when it hits full speed, it uh, woo-woos, it uh, pulls the whistle, and then it goes on the bell curve slower and slower. But it's something to rally people around. Uh, similar to the way squares would here in Europe. Um, that's uh, what artists um, have influenced you most? What great artists of the past have been a source of inspiration for you? Uh, uh, Manet, uh, you know, Manet, Marcel Duchamp, uh, in more re recent times, I say recent times, in the last 20 years, Picasso. Uh, Picasso's been around for a long time. You only got interested but, in him recently. But, yeah, I didn't really, I didn't, uh, you know, I thought about Duchamp. I thought about everybody I else. But, uh, you know, I really enjoy uh, Picasso. Uh, Titian, you know, I, I, I love, uh, you know, Renaissance. Uh, I love uh, Titian. Titian's amazing. I love Northern Mannerists, Spranger in Vienna. In uh, the Kunsthistorik, they have the greatest collection of Spranger. Spranger is amazing, one of my favorites. I'm sorry? Uh, you know, I, I like Brancusi, and of course, you know, my work uh, uh, references Brancusi, but my reflection, I really liked Robert Smithson. And so I was looking a lot at Robert Smithson when I first moved to New York, and Robert Morris was also creating a lot of reflective surfaces uh, on sculptures he was making, bent panels of copper that were very reflective. And But yes, uh, you know, Brancusi's uh, work, when you look at mine, ha you know, has to come to mind. Is there a question? Thank you. 
you were reflecting on how we're looking at uh, images so often and how that's affecting our short-term versus long-term memory and, and how, how art is being seen in this moment. Um, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and then you end it strong. Uh, well, it was a little bit about production in the time that we live. And I try to use technology as a tool only because I get pulled through the problems I have with my work. I'll end up working with the technology. So I ended up working with computers and doing white light scanning and then uh, cat scanning and uh, milling and uh, doing all these things only because it was more efficient than working uh, a more traditional way of, of casting. I could make things bigger, smaller, adapt them. But there's a lot of downside. There's a lot of time that goes into the engineering, reverse engineering of these files, managing these files. They get so big just to turn on the computer and keep it from crashing. Uh, and it ends up, some of my work, uh, you know, can end up taking six years, eight years to make. And uh, it, it's, a lot of it's due to the technology. So that uh, it's not necessarily making it faster, but making it more uh, precise. And uh, the cost, I really love to believe that, um, you know, when you see that work of art, you walk out of the room, it goes with you. And so you don't have to own a work of art. And there's a lot of cost that gets into some of these things. But uh, the, the viewer does not need to endure that. Uh, uh, I don't endure it in my own life. I experience so many amazing things. And I look at artworks that I could not in no way ever uh, have in uh, a home or do anything like this. Uh, nor do I think that I really want that responsibility all the time. Yes, Eric, that, Eric, that was, there was, it was double parted. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, there's a lady there. Is it, you also, uh, did I miss you? I'm sorry, you're, you're next. She's first, okay? Thank you. So the question is whether your own, you're artist, but you're also viewer of your own art. So does your perception of your own piece change over time, or is it just ready? I think it's pretty consistent. I mean, I look at it, and I think of the intentions. And usually what I'm saying today is what I said then. I don't really change things. Uh, because of what my intentions were at that moment, that's the closest that I know what those intentions were, and then I move on. So I'm not uh, recreating that. Uh, one thing I, I just like to say, I've never understood, I, I know that I've used the word polarities in speaking about my work here, and uh, masculine, feminine, and uh, all different polarities and things, but I've never understood the reaction uh, to my work. I've always felt that the viewer finishes it, but I always wanted to take them to a certain vista. And at least at that vista, I thought that the viewer would understand my intentions. But uh, that, uh, in today's world at least, that doesn't, uh, there's a, lo a lot of polarities. I've never understood some of the negativity uh, or some of the points of view. Who, who, who was next you said here? Was it you? Lady right there. Her? There and then there. Yeah. Okay, fine. And then it's my turn. You are a painter, creator. We're talking about our brain. Music. Is it so that when you are in your studio, Jeff, working, sitting, thinking, do you prepare to the job using even music? some kind of music, always the same theme or different. How strong is the impact of music? <clears throat> when I was younger and I was in the studio by myself, music played a, a greater role. 
uh, as my studio became bigger and there were more and more people in the studio, uh, it's very hard to have music uh, kind of uh, uh, blaring. But I would uh, train during uh, lunchtime and I would listen to music. I always listened a lot uh, to a lot of Led Zeppelin, but my children turned me on to uh, Little Uzi Vert and uh, uh, some um, hip hop and rap and, uh, and different things. So I'm very open. I thought the Litz piece that we listened to tonight, I mean, that was just, what could be more wonderful than the idea to start this off with that, uh, with that music because uh, we were talking about metaphysics. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the way music affects you is just amazing. You can be very depressed and listen to some Mozart and all of a sudden it cheers you up. Uh, it really has an amazing effect on you. But it's not something I find I can do as background. When I do this background, you know, when you're driving or something like that, you're really uh, not getting the real uh, impact of music. Um, to really get the pleasure out of music fully, uh, it helps to just concentrate on the music per se. Mr. Coons, uh, you be an artist in residence at uh, the institute where uh, Dr. Kandel is. And one of the reasons was that your uh, processes of creativity should inspire the students and scientists there. But uh, are there concrete things that you have also learned from being with all these brain persons for a long time? <laughs> uh, uh, yes, that uh, there's no real reality and uh, it's just all an illusion. <laughs> but I have to say it was so wonderful and it was, uh, at least for me, it was a great way to spend more time with Eric and with the uh, uh, the teachers, the other uh, Nobel laureates, right, and, and professors, but I actually received uh, private tutorials. I mean, uh, <laughs> I guess maybe every a month and a half, I, I would go up and for about two hours, I'd be able to uh, have one of the, uh, the professors speak to me just about uh, touch or, or taste and uh, or, or, or just the different sense uh, perceptions and uh, the study of the mind. So um, it's wonderful because I, what Eric was saying about bringing these uh, disciplines together, and it's I know very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but also in trying to make uh, works that uh, you know can be about the mind. I'm really curious when I was saying earlier about trusting in the self and then focusing on the interests. That's all that I know as an artist you can do. Uh, you can move some material around too, but again, if that's your interest in moving material around, but the only thing you have is yourself and your interests. And I, I think another interesting aspect about yeah. that is uh, that we tend to make very clear distinctions between art and science, as if they're worlds apart. But I think that that's incorrect. Uh, that most artists are, are experimental, very much like scientists are. And scientists have a sense of beauty and elegance, and they want to make their work as attractive, and comprehensible to other people as possible. So the, the clear division between art and science, I think, is spurious. That there is in every artist a scientific element, an exploratory element, uh, and there is uh, in every scientist a desire to do something which is beautiful. May I ask, uh, or make one comment and then maybe ask a question. Uh, I want to allude to Eric Kandel's recent book, Reductionism in um, art and brain science and I think it's a fantastic book. If you came here you should also read that book. Uh, it's, it's not very thick, it's readable in a few hours. And there you um, describe the evol evolution of uh, the reductionistic or let's say abstract art from Kandinsky onward to what you are particularly writing about the uh, New York School of Modern Art. 
And what you describe there is a development in the art going from a little bit figurative, like Turner, blah, 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 and then it becomes completely with Pollock and others. You, yes. I mean, you can't see, the brain has to work very hard to see a pattern, and it would probably divide the art viewers in those who think that it's very exciting and creative and other things, what is this? I mean, it doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, uh, but then now comes Jeff Koons, which you don't write about in the book, uh, virtually at all, and, and you bring in back figurativeness in a way. You, you show things. So, so the reductionist has taken another path through you. But my, my very concrete and simple question is, how much in your science have you yet applied the imaging techniques when the viewer is looking at, uh, at Turner, uh, the young Turner, at um, uh, the Konish or, or uh, Rotke or, or Pollock or Koons. And uh, does it look very different in the brain when you look at these three very different artists? Very figurative, <laughs> you know, very abstract, <laughs> and in between. You will not believe this, but I, Daphne Shahani and I are doing exactly that right now. We're doing imaging studies when a subject looks at the same artist, when the artist is figurative, when the artist is abstract, and when the artist is transitional, to see how the brain responds to it. So what is happening is, with the capability of imaging methodologies right now, we can bring brain science to bear on a whole bunch of issues in music and art that it couldn't before, and really doing away with boundary conditions that existed. Okay. Now, it's really a, a fascinating time to be studying these things. Uh, do we have... We, we're just starting this. Like, you, yeah. we, have, we have to talk six months or a year from now. We're just starting this. Uh, I have a question up there, and who is next then? Okay, I'll come to you then. In, in a determined way? The brain is determined, but it's not <coughs> determined to prevent you from, you know, moving to the left and moving to the right. I mean, the enormous degrees of freedom that your brain has. So you don't have to worry. You have my permission to <laughs> think any thoughts that you have. You can't necessarily act on all of them, but you can think whatever you want to. Next question is here. Um, Jeff, your art has been... Um, objects and paintings, sculpture and paintings, and they're uh, passionate, uh, both from your side and the audience, uh, and they're in the room. How do you see this translating, if uh, it's possible, into VR, and uh, what kind of statue do you think VR and, and digital art representation will have in the future? I think it's very important, the original idea that you have for VR, for how uh, you know, successful uh, that project's are going to be. Uh, I'm tinkering around in that area. I'm trying to uh, come up with an idea that can function really well uh, for VR. Uh, because the area that I have been dealing with has been in this much more uh, physical uh, uh, contact of the, uh, the object. Next question is here. Uh, is there an embryo for a big artist in any child? What, how much, how do you look upon the brain, the plasticity of the brain and the best circumstances to, to be an artist? I mean, we are all our brains and some are musicians, some are neurologist or neuroscientist, and, but is it possible to create an environment around the child to get him, her, or he a big artist, so to say? What, what, because it must be related to a certain form of plasticity, of individual course. plasticity, or is it any, anything from the very beginning? before plasticity by environment has been, been uh, important. Plasticity to the environment occurs very early in brain development. So I don't think that's the limiting factor. But what you're saying is absolutely true. I mean, the environment that the child is brought up with, 
has an enormous impact uh, on their development and whether they're going to be interested in art or music. If they listen to classical music from an early age on, they're going to be interested in classical music. They may also listen to other things later on, but at least they can appreciate classical music and see what it has to offer. So I think early experiences in the arts is extremely important. Next question here. Uh, can I add to that? <clears throat> in in uh, my situation, uh, my parents were very supportive of me. And so it gave me a sense of self. And, uh, and because of that, you know, getting a pat on the back, like, oh, Jeff, that's really good. It, it gave me a sense that, uh, oh, you know, I'm a person that can contribute uh, to this uh, family. And then another important thing for me was I, my father was an interior decorator. And my father, we didn't have computers uh, when I was younger, so he would be working with graph paper. And I'd watch him design a room. And he would figure everything out just on a graph paper, like if a couch is six feet and it's by three feet, and you have a table that's two feet and a lamp. And I learned from my father that if you have vision, you can do anything. It's just a, and here's a system. That's a kind of scientific system just to, to lay it out, to be able to know what you're doing, what it's going to look like, and to have that vision. That's wonderful. Now, here. Mr. Uh, Dr. Kandel, hello, yes, here, yes. here, yeah, uh, Dr. Kandel, I'm curious to know how you have used or how it has impact your knowledge and your research in, in brain science, also your private life, I mean, your other life or also your scientific life, because you showed how you can touch and you, the plasticity of the brain. So how have you used this information to enlarge your own life, so to say? You mean my interest in art? How is it No, me? I mean, I'm just, you know, you know much more than most of us here about the brain and how you can influence the brain. So I'm curious to know how you have used that information in your own life. How have you used the information? Yes that I realized that in order to master something, you have to work at it, and you have to be willing to take time out to do it. So if I move into a new area, for example, uh, I take time out to, to really to try to come to it, at least you know, to a fairly satisfactory degree. And I give myself, a f I mean, I don't watch television very much. Uh, so in the evening, I either read or write. That gives me a fair amount of time to move into areas that I haven't even been before. And I love doing that, and I've done this all of my life, yes. And I like writing very much. From the time I was in high school, I was one of the editors of the school newspaper, and I actually wrote a column for a sports newspaper called Gotham Sports. I wrote something called Breaking the Tape with Eric Kandel. So I've enjoyed <laughs> doing this, and I've been writing you know, most of my life. It hasn't necessarily gotten much better, but I've been doing that. There is an old saying, how do I know what I think unless I read what I write? And I must say that really holds true for me because often when I decide that, gee, I would like to do something in this area, I sit down, my ideas are extremely vague, and so a combination of beginning to write and reading around it, you know, often I've read only a small fraction of the literature I need to read in order to come to grips with it, and uh, all of that is pleasurable. There is something very satisfying, but just, you know, acquiring knowledge. Uh, Lizzie tells me that we should uh, more or less conclude in a few minutes or in a minute or so. So we take one or two last questions and then we will ask uh, uh, our guest to conclude. Maybe particularly Eric Kandel, who had a shorter introduction, so you can conclude. I actually have a, a one question while you think about the last one to you again, related to the last one, if you want to reveal it, uh, what is your favorite art in your home? How do you, uh, what kind of art do you, do you collect around yourself? We have a, uh, every wall is filled with art. Uh, we have Beckmans, uh, we have Kokoschkas, we have an Israeli artist, very serious Israeli artist called Moshe Kupferman, what else do you think we should mention, Denise? 
First of all, we collect mainly works on papers. We don't have that many paintings. And so uh, we have things from the German Expressionist, uh, from Munch. We have things from We have Picasso, some lovely things by Munch. From the French, yeah. Yeah. Nolde. But every wall is occupied. But if you give us a very nice oil, we would replace some of the works on paper. <laughs> <laughs> you should ask. Yeah. You, yes. uh, do you have a coons? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no, we do have one. <laughs> you do have one. We have the rabbit, of course. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. We absolutely have one. Yeah. <laughs> is, is there a last question from the audience? I, I think of it more as a sculpture. Oh. Than Can we yeah. take how many questions do we allow now? Last one. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, th thank you. Uh, this is a question for. Uh, <laughs> Eric Candele, I remember in the year 2000 when you got the Nobel Prize, uh, you told the, the audience that you moved from psychoanalysis to psychiatric because you realized that you could change the mind, not in years, but perhaps in weeks. And then I, I saw actually a, a TV program where you said that you were now interested in deep brain stimulation, a technique that you implant electrodes in the brain to modify functions in the brain. So my question would be, if you still think uh, that is the, the, the modern approach or you th think that there is something else you think is the, 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 the way you can modify the brain functions? I think brain functions can be modified in many, many ways. Uh, and it's true that uh, fairly primitive methods like direct brain stimulation can be very helpful in a variety of circumstances. Uh, but we really need to develop new techniques for being able to influence the brain, if possible, in a less invasive ma manner than that. And we're far from there. But it would be very nice if we could um, stimulate at will any one of the major structures within the brain and uh, you know, without necessarily having to put an electrode in it. You're using a beam of some sort. But we're nowhere near there yet. Yeah. We're going to take last words, Jeff and Eric, before we close this session. Any reflections, anything that you want to tell our audience or each other? Well, let me begin. <laughs> First of all, it's a, just a privilege <laughs> to be able to do this with you and to hear you. Uh, and it's just a wonderful opportunity to interact with this audience. It's a very alive audience. It's obviously paying attention, have their own ideas about things. So this was a very enjoyable evening for me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, absolutely. What an honor to, uh, to be here with uh, Eric and, uh, in Stockholm. And uh, we were here together uh, several years ago. But I, I think what's uh, important, and, and this is just about the, uh, the art world in general, that uh, we hear a lot about values and things like this, but the, the real value of art is its transformative power in our lives. So it lets us have a, a chance to become uh, an individual that we can become. And what I learned, I always loved all those stimulations, like Eric, you're talking about like electrons or something uh, to stimulate something. <laughs> But I've always enjoyed the stimulations, the chemical reactions of putting different things together, that intensity. And I became addicted to it. And then I started to share that addiction with friends around me because you tend to like the same things. And as time goes on, you continue to make these things that stimulate you and let you continue to become. And you automatically want it to share that with others. So the beholder share also, it's something that is embedded in art. And I think it's embedded both uh, in it intellectually but physically too, that you automatically, uh, whenever you have sensations or something uh, in abundance, you want to share that with others. Like, uh, so there's something communal. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was really uh, Alois Fiegel who coined that term. He realized that um, there are two creative processes in a work of art. The artist who creates it and the beholder, the viewer who looks at it. Because when you look at a work of art, you yourself are undergoing a creative experience. 
uh, first of all, just to perceive it, but also there's sufficient ambiguity in every work, even the most figurative, that you and I would look at the same work of art, we'd see it somewhat differently. That means our mind is perceiving it in different ways and playing it differently in your brain than it is in mine. That's actually quite fascinating. Thank you very much. Jeff, Eric, thank you very much. Thank you for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. As always, as always. Wait a second, wait a second. Wait a second.